So thank you, Patrick, so much for coming on. I've got uh, Patrick McEwen here, uh, author of The Oxygen Advantage. Um, I've been a massive fan for about three or four years since I first heard you on a podcast, went out and got the book, and since then I've been reminded of you daily because those practices from the book I've incorporated into my life daily. You know, I tape my mouth closed every night for the last few years when I sleep. Um, I breathe through my nose when I exercise and I exhale out the air in my lungs when I go underwater, when I want to see, you know, how long I can sort of hold my breath in a safe way. Mm -hmm. I certainly only, mm -hmm. only until that urge. Um, sure. So, yeah, so, but it's, it's, a, it's Oxygen Advantage is the name of the book, but it's much more of a story about carbon dioxide, which is mm. something that is so basic in its principles. Um, and this is what changed my world when I, when I first heard about it all from you. Um, could you explain carbon dioxide, its role with oxygen, and and maybe the Bohr effect as well? Sure. Yeah, I think people make a mistake in the belief that if you breathe hard, you get more oxygen delivered throughout the body. You know, there's often that thing put out there. You're stressed, take a deep breath, take a big breath. You know, and we have to bear in mind that when oxygen transfers from the lungs into the blood, ninety eight percent is carried by hemoglobin molecules. And hemoglobin is a protein in the red blood cell. But hemoglobin releases oxygen in the presence of carbon dioxide. So if we breathe too hard, we get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. This reduces carbon dioxide in the blood. And as carbon dioxide is reduced in the blood, blood pH increases. And hemoglobin, which is the carrier of oxygen, holds on to oxygen more readily. So oxygen doesn't get delivered so easily. So in actual fact, the harder we breathe, the less oxygen that's delivered throughout the body. And also the harder we breathe, the more our blood vessels constrict. So people who often have, you know, dysfunctional breathing, they'll often, it'll often manifest as cold hands or feet or brain fog. And also I think most people realize that if they take five or six big breaths, they feel lightheaded. And that's not a sign of super oxygenation to the brain. That's a sign of the opposite. So it's a bit like breathing. And yeah, I didn't want to call it the, the carbon dioxide advantage because people would totally ridicule it. And apparently carbon dioxide was really used in medicine and in first responders up until about the 1930s and 1940s. And there was one medical doctor from the United States. His surname was Waters. And he totally started criticizing carbon dioxide, saying it's as toxic as urine. And then over a period of decades that he continuously criticized carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide then was removed. For instance, canisters in the back of fire trucks was removed, um, ambulance personnel, hospital personnel, individuals with anxiety disorders. And um, before that, they were administered carbon dioxide because, of course, if you gently increase carbon dioxide in the blood, you increase blood flow to the brain. And that can have a calming effect. So carbon dioxide was removed and uh, pills were brought in. That's, in. that's just fascinating. It's so many questions from that. Um, but I want to make it obvious for people. When, we, when you say um, that the oxygen is carried through the hemoglobin and, and then it is delivered to the body, we're talking about its delivery to the cells and the mitochondria. Um, yes. So obviously that has a big impact for um, exercise. Um, obviously, the more oxygen in the mitochondria, the more fat they can use for fuel, um, the less free radicals that are produced. Is that correct? In terms of when you, if you like, if you're working an exercise, if you're exercising a muscle hard, you need oxygen to be delivered to that muscle, and an exercising muscle becomes hot and generates more carbon dioxide. So an exercise muscle changed the environment in order to attract more oxygen to that muscle. But if the carbon dioxide in the blood is too low, well, if the carbon dioxide in the lungs is too low because of hard breathing, the carbon dioxide in the blood is too low, and the carbon dioxide then in, in the tissues can be too low. And as a result, there's not enough oxygen getting to that working muscle. The hydrogen line then coming from the muscle doesn't get oxidized. That's forming with that's associating with um, pyruvic acid to form lactic acid, and then lactic acid is rapidly dissociating into hydrogen ion and lactate, 
and this is causing fatigue. So it's not just, I suppose, that when we're looking at it in terms of exercise performance, we really need to consider an athlete's or an individual's tolerance to the gas carbon dioxide, because if they have a poor tolerance to carbon dioxide, their breathing is going to be hard. And this will translate into disproportionate breathlessness for that individual. So athletes who are gassing out too soon. And oftentimes strength and conditioning coaches will say that it's due to poor condition, but they don't necessarily consider the impact of a breathing pattern disorder that that individual may have. And much more common than we think, much more common. Um, a Cochrane review said it was about 9.5% of the population. In some studies, it shows it's about 30% of the asthma population. I think it's much more because I worked with asthmatics for eight years straight, just with people with asthma from 2002 until about 2010. And I, hardly any of them would come into me with proper breathing. Um, and maybe they're coming into me because they have Im improper breathing. But, and the other group that's more prone to, to breathing pattern disorders are people with panic attack and anxiety. And of course, your athlete population is going to have, you know, a mirrored reflection of the individuals with asthma and with anxiety and with panic disorder. And an athlete could be training hard, but no matter how hard they train, they plateau. And their training hard doesn't change breathing patterns because it's your everyday breathing that determines your breathing during physical exercise. Yeah. So, the, yeah, it's... The carbon, the carbon dioxide tolerance, that's a huge headline there. And that kind of is how the body works, isn't it? Especially for athletes, that tolerance of how much can you be comfortable with being built up in your... I guess from a mitochondrial level, a cellular level, uh, a blood level and, and the lungs, like there's a few different levels it sounds like you're saying where the fat exchange happens. Um, so I guess there's a few different places where you can build up that tolerance to higher levels of carbon dioxide, which then therefore allow that higher levels of oxygen to pass from one level to the next. Um, so how can, we, how can we kind of work on that carbon dioxide tolerance um, in a practical way. Yes, yeah. The, the main one is carbon dioxide in the blood because the respiratory center in the brain is, is, is sending the, the stimulus to breathe based on the increased carbon dioxide and resultant drop to the blood pH. But it's the carbon dioxide in the lungs which determines the carbon dioxide in the blood. And to give you an example, if you have an individual who switches from mouth to nose breathing during physical exercise, Initially, it feels a lot tougher. It's more difficult because the nose is smaller than the mouth and the nose imposes a resistance to breathing that's about two to three times that of the mouth. Nose slows down breathing. Now, when you do physical exercise with your mouth closed, carbon dioxide can't leave the blood as quickly through the lungs. So carbon dioxide increases in the blood and carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. So as carbon dioxide increases in the, in the blood, you feel a stronger air hunger. However, if you continue to do all physical exercise with your mouth closed for about six to eight weeks, the air hunger diminishes because the body has adopted to increased CO2. And if you look at the work, this, the science has really been so well behind with this. You know What we've been seeing for 20 years like we've been using, for example, breath holding in obstructive sleep apnea for 20 years. And only in 2018 did the paper come out by a Harvard medical doctor, Luciano Messino, something that we've been doing for 20 years. We've been saying the same with, with people with asthma, breathe through your nose, um, sleep disorders, anxiety, breathe through your nose, and of course, use your diaphragm and breathe slow. But with physical exercise, very little research, there was an Australian paper by a guy called Morton back in 1995. And it was a trickle of papers here and there, maybe three, four papers, five papers, very few. One back in 1991 by Dr. John Dulliard. But George Dallam is a professor from one of the universities in the United States, and he has an interest in nasal breathing during sports. And he's a triathlete, and he's also a very well-known triathlete coach. So he's a coach of Olympic athletes. He changed to nasal breathing during physical exercise about six years ago. 
And in the last few years, he's been putting out papers looking at the impact of what happens when you breathe through your nose during physical exercise. In one paper that was published back in 2018, he got a group of 10 recreational athletes. He said to them, I need you to do all of your physical exercise with your mouth closed for the next six months. And then we will measure, we will test. We will test the difference between nasal and mouth breathing after the body has adopted to it. There's no point in just getting a bunch of athletes who have been mouth breathing all their life during physical exercise and saying to them, now guys, today we're going to have you breathe through your nose and I'm going to see how you get on. And of course, they're going to do it poorly because they've never done nasal breathing during exercise before and their body hasn't adapted to it. And that's why it's really good with, with Dalham's paper. He did get the guys to breathe through their nose for six months and then he tested them. Six months, nose breathing versus mouth breathing. Nose breathing, they had 22% less ventilation. So they had 22% less breathing for the same intensity of physical exercise and they, had, they were able to achieve 100% of their work rate intensity, nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. The respiratory rate with nasal breathing was 30, 39 breaths per minute. With mouth breathing, it was 49. The carbon dioxide in the blood with nasal breathing was 44 millimeters of mercury. And with mouth breathing, it was 40. Now, already, you see that nasal breathing is showing a higher carbon dioxide in the blood. And a higher carbon dioxide in the blood means that the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is going to be less. More oxygen is getting delivered to the working muscles. And with nasal breathing, the, fractured, the fraction of expired oxygen was less. In other words, the athletes were breathing out less oxygen because their body had used it. Morton, the Australian researcher, found that out back in 1995. He said that the fraction of oxygen, the fraction of expired oxygen was less when you do nasal breathing during physical exercise. But here's the crux. People, if you go into any gym, you will hardly ever see anybody breathing through their nose during physical exercise. It's really, you know, it's really the minority. Maybe I wouldn't even say it's 1% of the population who's doing it, you know. Mm. And it totally doesn't make sense. Because here, for example, this is an anatomical model of the nose. And you see the nose here. So you have, you have the nose here and you have the lips here. This here is the nasal cavity. Now, you look at the size of the nasal cavity within the skull. It's sitting right just above the mouth. Here you have your mouth and your tongue and you have your hard palate and you have your soft palate. And if you were to rub your tongue along the hard palate right until it you feel the soft palate, you will understand that your nasal cavity is sitting above your mouth. So you've got turbinates there, you've got um, moisture that's brought into the, into the air. It warms the air, picks up nitric oxide, it regulates the volume, but also if you look at the mouth, the mouth has absolutely no function at all, nothing, in mm. terms of breathing. You're taking air into the mouth, and it's going directly into the lungs, and it's getting none of these benefits here. Yeah. So, so in an, in an, it's, there's no comparison. Um, that's why I can't get my head around. I'm not an athlete, yeah. but I can't get my head around why the universities, in terms of sports sciences, how, how have they missed this one? Mm. Because even if you think of... I think your vi our video froze there a bit, but even if you think of Australia as, as for asthma, Australia has one of the highest incidences of asthma in the world. And then the athlete population exercise induced bronchoconstriction can affect up to 50% of athletes. Nasal breathing will dramatically reduce bronchoconstriction. And the reason being because the nose is moistening and warming and the nose is carrying nitric oxide into the lungs Nasal breathing increases oxygen uptake in the blood by 10%. This was found out by Swift back in 1988. Nasal breathing is linked with the diaphragm. The diaphragm breathing muscle, that when we breathe through the nose, we tend to breathe low. When we breathe low, we're activating the diaphragm more. And there's a link between functional breathing and functional movement. Mm -hmm. Functional movement doesn't happen unless breathing is functional. And... If you look at the functional movement screen, and I know people give out about the functional movement screen, but use any screen that's looking at functional movement. I will guarantee you this. If the athlete has dysfunctional breathing, they will have dysfunctional movement. And that ties in a lot. Nitric oxide 
also helps boost um, oxygen in the in the body. Uh, it also helps. It's a antibacterial as well. Um, and then breathing into the belly, you also re- get vagal tone connection through the diaphragm yes. releasing, which therefore helps all the other things that you mentioned that is related to uh, nasal breathing, such as anxiety, better performance, yes. better mobility, all of that through having a, a more parasympathetic nervous system, yes. that better vagal yeah. tone. So it's really yeah, interesting. Switched Everything's switched connected. You're switched on and more relaxed. And this was discovered back in 1991 by Dr. John Dullyard, flow state. That athletes were more likely to be in the flow state when they performed the physical exercise with the mouth closed, breathing in and out through the nose. Now, nitric oxide is one of those amazing gases. And the nitric oxide coming from the nose and the nasal cavity, that when we breathe through the nose, we pick up this gas. Nitric oxide is brought down into the lower airways in the lungs and blood is redistributed throughout the lungs. And this helps reduce chest infections. But nitric oxide is also antiviral and antibacterial. And nitric oxide from the nose is isolated. The effects are actually isolated to the lungs itself. Now, you think of COVID at the moment. People are talking about washing your hands continuously. Don't touch your face, but nobody seems to be talking about breathe through your nose. You know, if you, when, when these restrictions are lifted, if you get into a, go into a gym and you have a group of individuals who are panting hard with their mouth wide open, there's a 42% greater water loss breathing out through the mouth. Uh, COVID is transmitted via water particles and breathing will do that. It's not just talking that does it or sneezing or coughing, but breathing, but mouth breathing will definitely. And it, you know, you may get away with one breath, you know, if it's got a small amount, you do have to bring a certain amount of the the virus into the body before it takes hold. Mm. So like I remember I was traveling right up, up to March the 17th is when I arrived back from Los Angeles and I was in crowded tube stations. I was on planes. I was everywhere. And, um, I did two things when I was in in group of individuals. One is I breathed hardly any air. And the other is I breathed through my nose. Mm. And I don't understand why nobody's talking about this. And James Nestor has a new book out. And in that, he talks about tuberculosis when it was spread back in the 1920s and 30s. The individuals who were more susceptible to TB were mouth breeders. Now, Doctors will argue this, and I've seen people argue against me and saying that the nose, the nose is not going to stop COVID. I'm not saying that the nose is stopping COVID, but I'm saying is whatever chance that we have of defending the body, the first line of defense, mm. I understand that the body has its own immune system. But let's look at breathing. Let's look at taking less and protecting the lungs, and the nose does that. So coming back to physical exercise, Less trauma to the airways, less dehydration with mouth closed. Um, You've got more alveolar exchange. It's much more efficient because if you're breathing fast and shallow, you're ventilating a lot of the upper regions of the lungs, but the greatest concentration of the blood is in the lower regions. Mm. So it just doesn't make sense. But the easy thing to do is to breathe through the mouth, but easy doesn't mean it's the best thing to do. Yeah, it's clear that. Every single benefit is through breathing through the nose. Um, I want to hit you up with a question uh, that I just thought of this morning. I was listening to a podcast this morning that Lance Armstrong was on, and Mm -hmm. he was talking about lactic acid, and he was given an example, and he said, um, you know, lactic acid is what stops us from running flat out nonstop up a hill. He said, if we stand at the bottom of a steep hill, then start sprinting, soon you'll slow, then you have to stop. He said lactic acid is what makes us stop. And I'm pretty sure that that's not accurate. Um, so I'm hoping you have a, a better answer as to, you know, what it is that would make us stop at that point. Yeah, I think, you know, there's different theories on this. One theory is the central governor theory that it's, it's your brain that really sets the limits of, of intensity. Mm-hmm. And your brain is monitoring blood flow and oxygen to the heart and maybe stress from the diaphragm. And when the heart is over revving or when the diaphragm is becoming too stressed, the brain is going to send a message to the legs and slow down the muscles in the legs. So 
it may not be technical. It depends really what theory that you're looking at. However, yeah. regardless of the theories, can you improve the buffering capacity? Can you delay lactic acid and fatigue? And yes, you can. Mm. Um, if you look at a, a paper that was published in 2018 looking at professional rugby union players from Australia, they were 21 years of age. They were <clears throat> in their peak competitive season. They divided 21 players into two groups. One group was doing repeated sprints with breath holding, which we do. And they were doing the breath holds exactly as we do it. Take a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose, hold, sprint for 40 meters. Um, and it was a departure every 30 seconds and eight reps. And after about 10 minute rest, you do a second set of eight reps. So the experimental group was doing their 40 meter sprints with breath holding. And the control group was doing anaerobic exercises, high intensity interval training, sprinting, and also cycling at a high intensity. They measured repeated sprint ability, which is a performance indicator in team sports. It's your ability to do an all out effort followed by a very brief recovery. And how many sprints can you do until exhaustion? So pre, pre trial, both groups were doing about nine reps before exhaustion. And after four weeks, the group who was doing the breath holding and the sprinting, after four weeks, their repeated sprint ability increased from 9 to 14.8. And the control group increased from 9, 9 point something to 10.2. So here you have a group of highly trained athletes. And usually in this group, the margins of a difference that you can attain in four weeks is not very high. But to be able to increase repeated sprintability from 9 to 14 in four weeks. And the other thing about this is, like, how is it happening? Well, athletes will train and they will train hard to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis. We measure blood oxygen saturation all the time. It's very easy. Little, a little device, you put it on your fingertips and it measures how fully loaded is the hemoglobin with oxygen. If you sprint with your mouth closed, your, your SpO2, your blood oxygen saturation will drop down to about 91%. If you sprint with your mouth open, it's about 93%. You're hardly hypoxic. If you sprint with a breath hold, you drop your blood oxygen saturation at least down into the mid 80s. Carbon dioxide increases quite significantly. So breath hold training disturbs the blood acid base balance to force the body to adopt. And it's possible that there's an increased buffering capacity inside in the muscle compartment so that the hydrogen ion coming from the muscle is buffered before it enters into the blood. So we can show a delay of lactic acid and fatigue, and there's, there's several papers now on this that, that have come out of Europe. Um, and again, like, so Lance Armstrong, yeah, he was taking EPO. And of course, you take EPO, which is the hormone, and it, it sends a message to the, the bone marrow to mature red blood cells. And so, yeah, to mature red blood cells. So you, you increase your oxygen carrying capacity. And if you've got an increased hematocrit and an increased oxygen carrying capacity, you've got more oxygen delivery to those working muscles, which in theory, you're not going to go anaerobic as quick. But like, again, sports people have overlooked breath holding. They've done high intensity interval training, which is quite traumatic to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis, whereas you could go for a jog in your living room holding your breath and it would have a much stronger effect. Yeah, that's, that was going to be my question. There's the ways of if you increase your CO2 tolerance, carbon dioxide tolerance, in, in the process of doing that, you will be releasing more mature hemoglobin cells. Is that correct? More red blood cells? Um, no, not necessarily in terms of if you increase your tolerance to carbon dioxide, your hemoglobin is more likely to release oxygen to the tissues. And that's based on the Bohr effect back in 1904. But when you do strong breath holds, um, it has a number of effects in the body. One is you've got a spleen, which is an organ located under the left side of the diaphragm. And it's your blood bank. And it contains about 8% of your red blood cells. And if you do five breath holds, your spleen releases blood into circulation. Another aspect is when you do breath holding, that your kidneys become hypoxic and deliver to a lesser extent. And this synthesizes a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO, what Lance was, was renowned for. 
and EPO then is causing a maturation of the red blood cells to improve oxygen carrying capacity. However, we don't always see that everybody responds to the aerobic aspect of it. We see some non-responders. So when people do breath holding to improve aerobic capacity, we can't always reproduce it at will. However, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do breath holding because breath holding also is improving buffering capacity. Breath holding is adding an extra load onto the breathing muscles. Breath holding is opening up the nose. With breath holding, you do get a spleen contraction. And with breath holding, you can increase blood flow to the brain. And breath holding can also train the central governor that the body can push it for harder and faster without overdoing it. So there's still an advantage to do it mm. and to in, get the body to make adaptations. In your book, you've got an example. You've got, I mean, you've got an exercise in your book where you maintain, you can maintain really good low levels of oxygen saturation um, for about 10 minutes. And um, does that help release more EPO if you're actually holding the, doing the breath hold for 10 minutes or so? Yeah, in the book itself, I have got an exercise there. We tend to do it for about two minutes. I think 10 minutes, you probably wouldn't be able to sustain it. I've um, tried. <laughs> I mean, uh, but we typically do it for about two minutes. And if you have a prolonged, if you have a longer duration of hypoxia, it does increase more EPO. So I think in one study from Canada, it showed that our EPO, if you held, not if you're doing breath holding, but if you expose your body to hypoxia for about 90 seconds, a minute and a half, EPO increased by 36%. Mm -hmm. Now, another study by De Bruyne showed that if you do five reps of breath holding, dropping your blood oxygen saturation down to 85% with a two minutes rest in between each rep. And if you do three sets with a 10 minutes rest in between each set, EPO increases by 24%. And this would be equivalent to spending six hours at an altitude of about 1,780 meters. So, you know, that's why we call it simulating altitude training. But te technically, we're not just lowering blood oxygen saturation, but we're also remarkably increasing carbon dioxide in the blood. The reason being is because we don't hyperventilate pre breath holding. Mm. So we, we drop the blood oxygen saturation to severe levels, but we don't drop them down to extreme levels. I, I want to stress the body, but I don't want to kill the body. I want to stress it, but I want to keep it within limits. And, you know, working in, with individuals, and I mean thousands of individuals, mm. Most of them were unhealthy people from 2002. So I'll always approach breathing exercise with an air of caution. And I will say that if anybody is pregnant, never do breath holding. Never do any breathing exercise that's stressful to you. If you've got high blood pressure, cardiovascular issues, kidney disease, any serious medical conditions, don't hold your breath. Don't do, strong, don't do breath holds to the point that you have a strong air hunger because it is a stress. But in saying that, breath holding for a young, healthy individual is a great adjunct to training. How can somebody, and I've got a personal interest here because my mum has autoimmune conditions and she's had a bit of an aversion to carbon dioxide for, for a long time, um, that is not comfortable holding her breath at all. How can somebody like that with chronic fatigue type issues um, build up a bit of carbon dioxide tolerance and get more comfortable and get more oxygen where it needs to go? I have to do it very gently over a period of time. So if you look at the book, there's one exercise that's called the breathing recovery exercise, and that's holding your breath for five seconds, breathing for 10, hold for five, breathing for 10. That's the first exercise that your mother should start on because yeah. it's very gentle breath hold. And then from that, after about, I would have her do that about five minutes per hour, six, seven times a day. Okay. So 35 minutes a day, five minutes per hour, six hours. Okay. So after that, then do that for a couple of days and maybe three days or four days. And then seeing how she's going with it, mm -hmm. then have her do a slow, reduced, gentle breathing. 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. Gently acclimatizing or conditioning the body to tolerate more carbon dioxide. So when you say the gentle, the gentle breathing, that is where you breathe very lightly, as little yes. as possible for 30 seconds. Yeah. Yes, to get an air hunger, that you're okay. slowing down the speed of air coming in and out of your nose, 
to allow carbon dioxide to increase in the blood so that you feel air hunger for 30 seconds. Yeah. From that, I'd have her do that for about four or five days. It's not, I can't exactly say four days, five days, could be mm. six days. It's really about how does the person, how, do, how are they getting on with it? Mm. Then from that, I'd have her standing up and assuming that it's chronic fatigue and it's fibromyalgia and it's autoimmune, but yeah. other than that, her heart and all is good. I'd have her take a normal breath in and out through her nose, pinch her nose, and walk 10 paces holding the breath. And I would have her do about four or five repetitions of that three to four times daily. And that would be going on for about a week. Then I would have her increase that because I've worked with people with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. I've made mistakes with them. I've launched them into too strong air hunger initially, and it, it floored them. So that's why we need to gently build it up. But I will say this, with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, I think it's good to stress the body a little bit, to get the body to make adaptations. Resilience is very low. Heart rate variability can be very low. Um, if they go for a walk, they have got increased lactic acid is the theory there mm. because of insufficient oxygen getting released to the working muscles. So there are a lot of lactic acid. And as a result, somebody with chronic fatigue syndrome goes for a walk for 20 minutes. They have to go back to bed for two hours, possibly. Yeah. So it's, I've seen the best results for chronic fatigue when we had the people do breath holding to a strong air hunger. Yeah. But you have to gradually condition the body to that point. And I've seen really good results. Now, helping chronic fatigue doesn't happen overnight. Mm. We're talking about three months to six months there. But yeah. this condition can go on for decades. So yeah. that's why three to six months is really worth giving it a go. Um, and there are some papers, not a whole lot of research, showing a link between chronic hyperventilation and chronic fatigue. So chronic fatigue is definitely one of those by doing slow breathing, breath holding, but doing it within the person's comfort levels, stressing them a little bit, but not overdoing it and gently building it up. Yeah. And um, another another sort of question about health is that the um, short breaths cause, cause that chronic low oxygen levels in the cells. Um, and low oxygen at the cellular level adds to insulin resistance, um, which is a big part of type 2 diabetes. Um, high blood sugar also stiffens the blood up, so less oxygen, again, even carried in the blood, let alone being allowed out of the blood. Um, so there's a lot of huge health implications for, I guess, chronic high blood sugar, chronic shortness of breath. Um, and then the flip side of that is, well, the best way for health would therefore be keep blood sugar stable you become better at fat burning and you get better at using oxygen in the fuel process as well have you explored much around those two far kind of ends of the spectrum in, in, and i'm curious to hear about the fat uh for aerobic capacity adaptation i'm only starting to look at it in terms of type 1 type 2 diabetes um, the reason that I didn't want to go down the whole path of type 1, type 2 diabetes is because we had a hard enough time getting breathing exercises accepted for asthma. And if I was going to start making the claim that we could also use breathing exercise for other conditions, people would have said it was a magic bullet. So we couldn't even get breathing exercise accepted for asthma. With the medical people, we couldn't get people with asthma encouraged to breathe through the nose. So, you know, that's why I was very cautious and very conservative about what claims could we make. We have 20 clinical trials on asthma, and yet, it, you know, there was no attention on it. Hmm. But coming back to, um, my, the book, The Oxygen Advantage, was, is sold in the United States. And this guy called Nick Heath, H-E-A-T-H, -E he bought the book. And he's a type 1 diabetes, diabetic. He was diagnosed when he was 12 years of age. And he was, he's a scientist. He was, he's a NASA-trained PhD. So, you know, he's an intelligent guy. And he was using diet. He was using physical exercise and continuously monitoring his blood sugar levels, et cetera. But it was when he changed his breathing patterns that made the big impact. So he went down the path of doing the research 
And he was looking at one researcher, Bernardi from Italy, an Italian cardiologist, that slow breathing and possibly breath tolling has been an excellent adjunct in, in helping people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So now I'm starting to go down. I'm writing a new book. And there's a few topics in the new oxygen advantage that I haven't covered in the old one. Type 1 diabetes will be one. Epilepsy will be another one. Um, females breathing is another one because females are more prone to chronic hyperventilation syndrome because of hormo hormonal changes than men, especially as part of their monthly cycle. And nobody seems to put the connection between how their breathing is impacting their pain. Um, Temporomandibular joint, looking at sleep, looking at functional movement, increased risk of injury when your breathing is off. Um, so I'm looking at other topics, and that's why I'm what I'm going. But I'm not until I really get the information so well versed in my head. I don't want to talk about it because yeah. I I just am in, in the process of learning it. And you know, when you start going down the, the road of a new topic, for me, you know, I really want to become comfortable with it before I talk about it. But you know, in terms of breathing, when you look at the application of what slow breathing can do. And slow breathing to a cadence of 5.5 or 6 breaths per minute to stimulate the vagus nerve, to exercise baroreceptors or pressure receptors in the major blood vessels, to increase heart rate variability. And high coherence in heart rate variability is a good indicator for recovery. To achieve a balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system in the body. And individuals who are not well, either emotionally or physically, they have reduced HRV, reduced heart rate variability, and poor functioning of the autonomic nervous system. But you can influence this by slowing down your breathing to 5.5 and 6 breaths per minute. So we do now more coherent breathing. So I look at breathing from a biochemical point of view, from a biomechanical point of view, and also from a coherent point of view. And it would seem that these go hand in hand with the fuel being burnt. Um, you know, like glucose is a much more anaerobic state, much more anaerobic fuel to be burning. So whether it's you're eating the high carb diet or you're breathing very short and shallow, you get the same response in some ways, in some respects. Um, and the same could be said if you were having good low blood sugar stability and long, slow breaths, you are going to be more aerobic all the time. But let's say if you were still having a very high sugar diet, the breath may help, I'm sure, but do you think that just that abundance of fuel and inability to burn fat would still prevent a little bit of that, bent those benefits of increased oxygen through to the cells? Yeah, there's a yoga instructor from Australia who's really well known. Simon Borg is his name. And he had a theory a number of years ago saying that people who chronically hyperventilate because of the loss of carbon dioxide, it increases blood pH. But the body doesn't want to have too alkaline blood pH. So the theory goes that people with too high blood pH, they have a craving for acidic forming foods to normalize their blood pH. And there may be something in that, because if you look at breathing of people who are unhealthy and breathing of people who eat poorly, they often have poor breathing. Hmm. Is it, the, is it the, the processed foods and sugary foods and acidic forming foods that's changing their breathing patterns? Hmm. Or is it a poor breathing pattern in the first place, hmm. which is feeding into their cravings of processed foods? That I don't know. But from the point of view of food, if you can improve sleep, you can change hormones, including leptin and ghrelin. And ghrelin is, is a food appetite promoter. Mm. So if you have an individual who has poor quality sleep, that they stop breathing during their sleep or have restriction to their breathing, they've increased ghrelin, they feel hungry, they eat more, they put more weight on, this, this impacts their sleep, and it's a vicious circle. Mm. And the other aspect then is, <clears throat> in terms of doing slow breathing, you're activating a parasympathetic response. You're reducing stress levels because the body is more, you know, the mind is more stable. And as a result, people may not be going to the fridge as quick because of comfort eating. Mm. So I think if, you, if you've got reduced stress and better sleep, 
And also, if you've got better breathing, because if you've got better breathing, you feel in form of doing physical exercise. The people who need to do physical exercise the most are less likely to do it because they feel too breathless. The ones that can't get off the couch, the ones with a bowl score, breath hold time of five seconds, they go for a short walk, they have labored breathing. They don't want, they don't want to persist with it because they don't enjoy it. No. If these individuals started practicing slow breathing and reduced breathing while sitting down, build up their bowl score to a foundation 12, 13, 14, 15 seconds, then walk. Because it's a lot more enjoyable if you can walk at a decent pace with your mouth closed and you increase your body temperature, you increase your heart rate, your breathing is getting faster, but it's comfortable. And you're getting all of those feel-good benefits from physical exercise. But the person who needs it most, they can't do it. And that, that comes back. It's, it's just all so connected to the breath. Um, because in your book, you also talk very well. You explain it really well about the mindset connection there. Um, things like anxiety and things. And if you are somebody who has anxiety and short breath, to say yes. you need to sit for five minutes, do nothing, think of nothing, and breathe into your belly. Those are yes. the people who really struggle with it because yeah. 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 their mind yeah. will not um, uh, yes. quiet. And and you kind of use the phrase the distracted mind a lot and yeah. being a big yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah. The very group that need mindfulness most can't do it. Mm. So, and the other thing about mindfulness is that. The whole idea that follow your breathing will sort out your breath, it doesn't. Mindfulness was developed two and a half thousand years ago. Mindfulness is originally came from Buddhism, and it was a guy called John Kabat-Zinn that took it out of Buddhism, but he's of Jewish faith, and he wanted to have a technique that was not religious-based. So I will say this. We have people coming in with anxiety and depression and panic disorder. And they're going to their psychotherapist and they're going to their psychiatrist and they're going to their psychologist. Nobody is looking at their breathing patterns or at least nobody is looking at it to the real depth that they should be looking at it. And nobody is looking at their sleep. How can you attain a quality of a calmness of the mind unless you've got slow, low and quiet breathing? How can you attain a quality of calmness of the mind unless you have good quality sleep. So when people come in, say, with depression, always ask, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? And more often than not, they will tell you that they wake up feeling exhausted. How can you feel anything other if you're under chronic exhaustion over a prolonged period of time? So normally what's happening here is that maybe the healthcare professional is thinking that it's the depression which is causing the exhaustion. But maybe we should be looking at the other way around, that it's the exhaustion that's leading to chronic anxiety and chronic anxiety, which is feeding into the depression. So I had, I had 3,000 people do training with Buteco, and we used it. We call it the Buteco Mindfulness Method from 2010 until 2013 here in Ireland. Because, of course, our economy was down to Swanee because of greedy bank bankers and politicians that have absolutely, and at least in Ireland anyway, zero intelligence and power-hungry individuals who, who hadn't the foresight to see what was coming down the tracks. But in any event, there were a lot of anxiety and a lot of, lot of stress. And I had people coming in and, you know... I made mistakes working with some of these individuals. I had them do really reduced breathing because, yeah, I'm increasing blood flow to the brain. But I put them into a state of air hunger and I put them into too much of a fear response. So I learned through trial and error working with these individuals where to go and a little bit like chronic fatigue. Sometimes, you know, it wasn't part of my training. I wasn't gave that training. And, you know, you're working with an individual and you're just thinking, this isn't quite right. There's something here that I need to tweak. And you tweak it along the way. And this is what experience gives you. So, you know, it is very frustrating. With, say, 3,000 people, I asked them, how many of you meditated? How many of you ever focused on your breathing? It was a small amount. Anyway, it was about maybe 5%. And I asked them, how many of you still focus on your breathing? And it was pretty much none of them. And the reason being is because 
it must be very frustrating having to focus on your breath when there's such an undercurrent of emotion there and you don't have the energy levels to do it. So mindfulness is not for the people who need it most. The people who need it most should be doing breathing techniques, but they should be doing breath holds. And the reason being is this. If you do gentle, small breath holds, you can increase blood flow to the brain. And by increasing blood flow to the brain, it can have a calming effect on the central nervous system. But I would also say, look at these people's sleep. And I would have them do slow breathing with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs to get diaphragmatic breathing because of the connection between the diaphragm and the emotions. But I wouldn't necessarily have them focus on their breathing. Having them doing breath holding, they're counting. So it's still going to distract the mind to help bring a stillness to the mind, but increase blood flow to the brain. I would also have them, people with panic disorder, breathe in through their nose, breathe out, hold their nose, and walk five or ten paces holding their breath again. Because when the mind is agitated, the best thing to do is to hold your breath, because holding your breath is increasing blood flow. As you hold your breath, carbon dioxide increases in the blood, and as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, the carotid arteries dilate. So I think there's a tremendous tool that we can be using to help people with anxiety and depression and panic disorder. That counseling doesn't change respiratory physiology, but human beings, we are very much stuck in our own silos. I, from a breathing point of view, looked at biochemistry for, for 15, 16 years and didn't deviate outside of it. But biochemistry is only one aspect of breathing. Now I look at biomechanics. Now I look at coherent breathing. We're doing breath holding. We're looking at sleep. We were looking at sleep anyway. So we need to look at it. And I'm not saying this just to complicate things. But the psych psychotherapist is looking at counseling, but they're not looking at, they're looking at cognitive behavioral therapy. But more often than not, they're missing respiratory physiology. How can you, how can you show that person? How can you help that person to have a calm? of the mind if they're in a constant fight and flight response because of fast upper chest breathing and 80 percent of people with anxiety and panic disorder have dysfunctional breathing patterns it's not just that anxiety is changing breathing patterns but dysfunctional breathing patterns is feeding back into anxiety and it's time as human beings that sometimes we look outside the box and we look at the bi-directional relationships to that functions of the human body have on each other. Mm. And yes, I've been in my own silos. Many people were stuck in silos. Yeah, I often explain health as kind of either in a positive cycle where one negative thing is affecting another negative thing and then you get back to the start again in that circle or, or you're doing everything right and that positive thing affects the next positive thing. So I always look mm -hmm. at it as you're either in a positive cycle or a negative cycle. Um, very rarely are you totally going nowhere. Um, we're always going somewhere. Sure. Um, so that that basic level of um, premise of that it is the higher levels of carbon dioxide that give us that hunger for air. Um, and uh, if we were yes. just doing a breath hold, which let's say we did only walk 10 paces, felt quite a strong breath hold, our oxygen levels would barely have dropped in, you know, 10 seconds, right. would they? But that higher carbon dioxide level, yeah, would would um, and doing that repeatedly though, would that be like quite a good benefit for anybody? As you said, because that would just if you can hold your breath till the hunger and then take in a few good breaths, just yeah. regular breaths, you're going to really boost oxygen through to the cells, the brain, and everywhere. Yeah, like it's. You know, if people if people feel a strong air hunger by holding their breath for ten paces, they've got really strong sensitivity to carbon dioxide buildup, and they have well, exercise let, intolerance. Let's say, however so, long it takes you to get that strong hunger, you are going to get that ben elevated levels into the cells after just that one breath hold. Yes, it does. It increases blood flow. One breath hold will increase blood flow to the brain. And one breath hold will cause a right shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. But typically we do five breath holds. And uh, we, we want to do a breath holding to stress, but we, want, we don't want to overdo breath holds at the same time. Yeah, nice. Um, I wanted to also then clarify, 
um, what's happening, the difference between um, when somebody is sprinting and that sprinting does trigger uh, a heavy, heavy breathing, obviously because of the CO2 levels are higher, um, but are the levels in the cells changing much at that point it, with the laboured breathing though? So it's like kind of the opposite. So normally laboured breathing would mean that you're low CO2, but when you're exercising, does laboured breathing, like when you are really going hard and yeah. it has to be laboured, uh, are you still getting, I guess that's a relative amount of oxygen levels I- into the cells as well? Well, it depends on, you could argue, if people have reduced CO2 in the blood initially, and if they go for a sprint, they have reduced oxygen delivery to the working muscles. So yeah. they're going to run out of air. They're going to be you know, running without air. Um, but carbon, if you go for a sprint, you're, you're, carbon, you're- dioxide, carbon dioxide during the day, during rest, during sleep, it doesn't vary within about three millimeters of mercury pressure unless you're doing breath holding during sleep, you stop breathing. Mm. But if you go over and do physical exercise, yes, your cells produce more carbon dioxide, but the carbon dioxide in the blood will remain almost the same because as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, the stimulus to breathe increases. So the body breathes harder. So the body is always striving to achieve homeostasis in terms of carbon dioxide. And the body is very sensitive to, to a buildup of carbon dioxide. A two to five millimeter increase of mercury of carbon dioxide will double ventilation. That's not very much CO2. We are very sensitive to an increase of carbon dioxide. But if we gently expose our body to a slight increase of carbon dioxide over time, we reduce the sensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide. Mm. And well trained and elite athletes normally have reduced chemosensitivity of carbon dioxide to carbon dioxide, and they have got reduced ventilation. So if you think about, we have to ask the question, how much air do we need for a given duration and intensity of physical exercise? And if we have good breathing, functional breathing, we are efficient with our breathing, we're economical with our breathing, um, And, you know, there is an energy saving cost there because if you can do physical exercise with less breathing, you're not wasting so much oxygen supporting the breathing muscles. As we sit here, about two to three percent of our oxygen consumption goes to support the breathing muscles. If you go for a walk, it's about maybe five percent. If you go for a run, it's maybe about eight to ten percent. And if you do maximum exercise, maybe about 13 to 15 percent. But if I asked you to hyperventilate, breathing in and out hard for 30 breaths, the, your oxygen, your VO2, your oxygen consumption there to support your breathing muscles can increase to as high as 30%. So the harder you breathe during physical exercise, the more oxygen that's supporting the breathing muscles, but also the more likely that your breathing muscles are prone to fatigue. Because if you're overworking the breathing muscles, they get tired. And if they get tired, blood is stolen from the legs to feed the diaphragm. So if you see an athlete going for a run, they've got a good pace, and the next thing is the legs start going from under them, you have to ask the question, is that due to a buildup of hydrogen ion, or is it because of diaphragm fatigue? Yeah, um, I had a question in my head, but I'll come back to it and go back to something you mentioned earlier, and that is people with sort of chronic fatigue issues, and and that's what I've had um, for 20 years. And in 2018, I took the year off exercise, off training and racing um, because I just needed to figure everything out. But in that time, so the first few months, aches, pains, lactic acid, just kind of doing the lightest exercise felt terrible. But I went back and was doing the exercises from the book of the whole, lowering my, um, lowering my oxygen awesome. levels and increasing my CO2 for kind of that five minutes at a time. And I was doing it every day. And the benefits were huge after two weeks. So I went from swimming, breathing every two strokes, doing like a hard hundred meters, to doing yeah. to breathing every four strokes every for, for a hard hundred meters. And so I almost yeah. doubled that. And so I wanted to relate that to other experiences that I've had um, seeing athletes that are, are quite competent swimmers, but in a race, they'll obviously have quite a high high um especially in a triathlon you're in a crowd there's a bit of stress and they'll be 
really high stroke rate because they're sprinting at the start. So therefore they're breathing really quick because they're breathing every two. So then their shortness of breath brings on a little bit of an anxiety and then that anxiety builds so much that it shortens the breath even more. And I've seen experienced, very good swimmers, experienced athletes have panic attacks in the water because that, and I put it down to that really quick stroke rate, a little yeah. bit of an anxiety starts and then that yeah. just ignites the fire and it feeds into itself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's for swimming. It really makes, makes sense to have efficient breathing going across the pool. And the reason being is because if you can, if you can cover a pool with least, least, least amount of breaths, you're not losing propulsion. You know, if you were to go from one side of the pool to another on one breath, that would be most advantageous. Mm. Every time that you need to take a breath, you have to turn your head. You're losing propulsion. Well, the hydrodynamic 50, drag. I think the Olympic meter 50, the 50 meter it's Olympic swimmers. Uh, yeah, one breath. Yeah, it's, in, it's amazing. 20, about 20 something seconds, yeah. flat out effort. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. And, but even if you have, say, endurance athletes, you know, in a, in a long swim, it really mm. makes sense. You know, a few things about swimming. Swimming is a very good sport for helping to train the breathing muscles because there is a resistance to breathing because of the body is against the water. And when you're breathing against resistance, it does help to improve respiratory muscle strength. Swimming in theory also should reduce the sensitivity to carbon dioxide because your face is in the water, so you're naturally breathing less air. But with some swimmers, they have a difficulty exhaling properly. And so they breathe in, they have a partial exhalation. They breathe in again, they have a partial exhalation. The diaphragm is not moving back up to the resting position. This then can if, cause a trapping of air, hyperinflation. But also because the diaphragm isn't moving back up to the resting position, it affects the zone of apposition, it affects intra-abdominal pressure, and in turn it affects functional movement. So swimmers should be, like it's like this, not just swimmers, but every athlete or any, any person should be looking at their everyday breathing patterns. How do you breathe when you're sitting down watching TV? How do you breathe when you're lying in bed at night? Like nobody should wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. Hmm. One of the first things, I went to secondary school and I used to be absolutely exhausted in class, falling asleep. And we kids are measured academically on their basis to achieve grades academically. Their intelligence, they're told, you, if you have good grades, you are an intelligent child. And if you have poor grades, well, you must be stupid. But nobody is looking at these kids' sleep. And 25 to 50% of children are mouth breathing. Those children are going to be set back in terms of poor sleep. And I having dreadful quality sleep for decades, well, two and a half decades. And then I read a newspaper article about getting your mouth closed. And that night I wore a nasal dilator, a breed right strip across my nose. And I taped up my mouth. Yeah, in the first morning it wasn't kind of still getting used to it. The second morning I woke up and I had an alertness that I had never experienced before in my lifetime. I couldn't ever remember waking up feeling alert. And it's crazy. You know, it's, it, this is just one of those things that breathing is not sexy. If you're a medical doctor, you're not going to do a clinical study on breathing because your peers are not going to appreciate it. You want to do a study on stem, stem cells. You want to do research on something which is really sexy. Breathing through the nose, so what's that? Why would you bother doing research? And there is a little bit of that going on there. And that's why breathing hasn't got the attention. And I think it's a, it's a big issue. And it's, it is coming back to that, Pete. It's any athlete, you know, any individual, any person working in the corporate world. If you look at the traits of people who are successful, they've got good concentration, they've got good energy, they've got good resilience, and they are well able to handle stress. We should be all able to do that. That's part of human nature. You know, we've been able to do it throughout our evolution. And we can improve all of those things by focusing on our breathing. Hmm. Oh, can, you, can, you, can I give you one more question? Yeah. Time. I want to just quickly, I guess, just talking, and this can be a short answer. Um, 
But if somebody is particularly unwell with, with autoimmune, with chronic fatigue type issues, I mean, if they had a job that required them to talk all day, would that potentially be harming them even further? Because does talking lower carbon dioxide levels even more? Yes. Talking is very tiring mentally. Mm. Um, you think of anybody who is working for a living and they're talking all day long. And at the end of the day is talking, many of these people will be exhausted depending on genetic predisposition. The rule of thumb with talking is never hear your breathing during talking. Now, you know, you could say, well, breathe through your nose during each sentence or between each sentence. It's not likely. You know, some people will do it. And um, there is a dentist from Australia, Simon Wong, and he will deliberately give a sentence and then he takes in a breath. And then he talks another sentence and then he's taken in a breath. But it's very difficult to really continue a cadence of speech and <laughs> yeah. to do that, you know, because you're trying to you're trying to balance everything. So what I would say to people is if you talk a lot, get your mouth closed at night. And, you know, I'm going to show you a new tape that we've brought out. And I would say this as well for parents with kids. I brought out a tape because I want to try and get children breathing through the noses. And we couldn't tape their lips for obvious reasons if a child was to get sick. But at the same time, if we leave the children breathing through an open mouth during sleep, it has craniofacial problems. And it also is impacting their sleep. And children who are tired, they have 10 times the risk of learning difficulties. Academically, they have a problem. And they have also got an increased risk of special education needs by 40% if sleep disorder breathing isn't treated by the age of eight. So I brought out a tape called Myo Tape, and it's not to plug it, because you could do it yourself with Kinesio Tape. So here's Myo Tape. So you could get a roll of Kinesio Tape, and that's what this is based on. And you peel off, it's, it's in strips like that. So it comes like that, you see it? Yep, yep, a, a square and with stretchable. a pen. It's stretchable. Right. So the, just the elasticity of it being around the outside of the lips, you stretch it when you stick it down and then the elasticity pulls your lips yeah. back together. Yeah. Right. And yeah, no I'm, risk. Yep. Not very safe. I've still been using the piece of 3M micropore tape down yeah. vertically okay. down my lips and... Um, I've been doing that for, for many, many years, uh, as I said to you at the start, and um, I can't not do it now. I, like I just, yeah. if I do yeah. a cat, once in a while, I actually lay down, fall asleep before I've put it on. And, um, you know, I just wake up and just fit, through the night, I'll wake up or I'll wake up and there's drool and things everywhere. And I just don't, don't enjoy it. I don't feel as good and refreshed as when I tape it, tape my mouth yeah. closed. Yeah. I've had yeah. the no, oximeter. Yeah, I've had yeah. an ox oximeter, pulse oximeter to test my blood saturation levels. For, again, since I got the book, um, that's been invaluable for those breathing exercises for that feedback because um, mm -hmm. a lot of the exercises are hard to do without that feedback. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be like, I guess, swimming laps of the pool without a clock. You don't actually know yeah, if you're yeah. getting better or or if what you're changing and feels is working or not. Um, so that's been unreal. Um, the the breathing exercises again like when i had really bad chronic fatigue for that period in 2018 did the exercises and then i could go riding and actually i wasn't getting lactic as soon as i as i had mm -hmm. been because that's mm -hmm. exactly what you mentioned is that people with chronic fatigue will have feel lactic when their heart rate is still very low because mm -hmm. the oxygen's not getting through so it's it's amazing that relationship between inflammation and the inability for tolerance of carbon dioxide. Um, I guess it's a huge I don't know part. if there's, um, is there a link between inflammation and tolerance of carbon dioxide, or is there a link yeah. between fast breathing and poor vagal tone and reduced heart rate variability and inflammation? Mm. And most definitely there is. And if you have fast and upper chest breathing, that in turn can be also influencing your carbon dioxide. So I suppose indirectly, you know, that there could be some relationship there. But, but it could be. You no, know, theory is theory. And what I will say is your experience is, is worth more. 
and here's another issue. Like I've had seven, 8,000 people, I don't know how many, a lot, 600 a year was typically who was, uh, I was working with. I've seen results consistently over 18 years, consistently. And yet, how many people with chronic fatigue are out there and they're, they're encouraged to nose breathe, to reduce their breathing, to do little breath tolls. And most of this, I have a lot of this information free on the internet. The children's program, I put the entire children's program free because I never wanted the kid to have nasal stuffiness, to have poor breathing, to be stressed, and those kids with asthma. So all of the exercise are up for free. And we've put a load of information out there. And this is, this is within reach of people. But these, this is where these podcasts are invaluable because you will reach out to a group of individuals. They will put it into practice. And it, the results speak for themselves. And I'm not saying that everybody is going to be cured or anything like that. It's nothing about that. Mm. But it's about applying something that has absolutely no side effects. If you're doing breath holds, you know, you know, be, be safer, you know, be, yeah. be sensible about doing breath holds. You know, it's not about holding the breath until you pass out and you go blue. Mm. It's about doing breath holds if they suit you, if you're medically, you know, mm. fit and okay. It's like the example of a chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, do, do strong breath holds today. You're going to be floor tomorrow. Mm. But in, instead, just gently build it up to suit you. Mm. And, uh, you know, the proof of the pudding, and here is the science hasn't caught up with chronic fatigue syndrome. The science has, has caught up with diabetes type 1. Those papers are there, slow breathing. But the problem is they're all on PubMed, and the individuals walking around with type 1 diabetes don't even know they're there. Yeah. They so, don't know what PubMed is. So. <laughs> it's, it's true, Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's fascinating how connected it all is, and and um, oh, I can't wait for the next book because I'm sure you're going to make a lot more connections. Um, you know, the mindfulness and anxiety from the first one, and all the exercises, everything that we've mentioned today, and lots more is in the Oxygen Advantage. And like mm -hmm. I said, the benefits that I noticed in two weeks of working with a oximeter and doing the exercises but you can just do the walking ones you don't need the the oximeter mm. to test um huge benefit in my ability to, to breathe less while swimming breathe less while riding up a hill um and also that lactic acid just did not did not occur as quickly i mean yeah, yeah. amazing that my mind was absolutely blown and my eyes were wide opened by just that book like i think more than any yeah. other book that i've read that has really changed more than anything how i see you know my own body i guess it is yeah, yeah. and i'm learning well, about Pete, it yeah what i'll say is this we we put stories into the oxygen advantage of real life accounts of individuals who would put it into practice i'd love to include your story <laughs> so we'll put in a we'll put in a section on chronic fatigue yeah and uh to provide a first-hand account of a, of a young individual who is going through chronic fatigue yeah. and simple things that you did that are in the book that people can, because I think that's what people can relate to. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm going to be sending to. you an email looking for your story in about 10 minutes. Fantastic. I'd love to. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's been unreal to talk to you and get to ask you some of my questions. Um, and my mum's questions. Um, thanks so much for the help on that. I'll, I'm going to be really onto her to make sure that she follows up with that sort of a protocol and um, follow up with how it goes. Sure. Cause she's a little bit like the, what we said um, she's, she can do the lying down and the calm app quite often, but mm -hmm. to that next level is getting that breathing just a little bit uh, less so that she mm. can start to get more oxygen, um, you know, where it needs to go and get that tolerance yeah. to carbon dioxide up. So it's yeah. going to make a huge difference for her as well, I'm sure. Maybe by the time the book's published, like we can put her story in for a 70-year-old <laughs> person with autoimmune conditions and how, how much it's helped them. But I'm sure you've got a 1,000 of those stories because um, you've been such a big help for so many people around the world. Um, and thanks so much for helping me as one of those sure. people um, a few years ago. And then so much, thank you so much for today. And, um, yeah. You're welcome. Look forward to, to the next book. Can't wait. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Thanks, Pat Thanks Patrick.